I'm Lynn Packer, and this is my video op-ed, Part 6, Operation Underground Railroad and the Covenant. This episode is mostly about LDS Apostle M. Russell Ballard's spiritual and financial connections to Tim Ballard and Operation Underground Railroad. Russell Ballard is the grandson of two former apostles, great-grandson to former church president Joseph F. Smith, and great-great-grandson of Hiram Smith. He was a Utah penny stock promoter and investor, a Salt Lake auto dealer, an entertainment venture stock promoter, and after Bruce R. McConkie's death, he was sustained as an apostle of the LDS Church. Since 2018, he's been president of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. Tim Ballard told associates that an impetus to leave his government job and form Operation Underground Railroad was President Russell Ballard asking for his help finding a child kidnapped from an LDS church parking lot in Haiti. The Russell Ballard calling story comports with Tim Ballard's fasting and prayer story. He said, I made the decision with my wife after much prayer and fasting to leave the government and to go looking for these kids who are outside the jurisdiction of the United States. After going to the temple, Ballard said he received a clear and undeniable answer. Find the lost children. The child, Gardy Marty, became OUR's poster child, much like a poster child of the 1950s in the fight against polio. Here's how a former OUR operative sees the Tim Ballard-Russell Ballard connection. He said they're very close. Tim was told, look, this is your calling from God. You need to start this foundation. He's got this relationship with Elder Ballard who blessed his work, so to speak, so he has carte blanche on everything. So if you stand in his way, you're in God's way. He's got the attitude that if you are not with him, that you are against God and the Mormon church. And OUR is all about his, that's Tim Ballard's name, his ego, and is bringing people to the covenant. So, what is the covenant? Tim Ballard wrote a book about the covenant. Actually, two books. Covenant lore has it that Tim's first book, released in October 2011, was read by Elder Ballard. After reading the book, Elder Ballard asked for Tim to meet with him. He did so for a three-hour visit. Elder Ballard said, every American needs to read this great book and counseled Tim to write another copy without the LDS doctrine in it for the mainstream. And through that endeavor, it will become a missionary tool. In 2012, Glenn Beck interviewed Tim Ballard about the covenant. The interview occurred more than a year before Ballard formed Operation Underground Railroad. Beck and Ballard discussed their belief that America became a promised land as a result of a covenant that key historical groups like the Pilgrims and men like George Washington made with God. I have a theory that we made a covenant, starting really with Columbus. Really then again, it really took shape with the Pilgrims. They honored that covenant. That gave us the, um, the generation of, uh, of the founders. And George Washington and the founders made a covenant with God. And it, it, is, it is the reason why we were founded, why we were protected, and why Israel was established. Now, Timothy uh, Ballard has, a, uh, uh, has a, the book out, The Covenant, and it is a theory that you're not going to get anyplace else. You're probably one of the very few, besides David Barton and me, that get teary-eyed talking about I do. I get, I, get, I, I get emotional. And then what happens? It's not over yet. George Washington comes out and takes his oath, raises his arm in the, in the, in the fashion of a, of a covenant maker, and places his hand on the Bible. But not just on the Bible, but in the Bible. Where he placed his hand told the world and the nation that he understood the covenants of Israel and that he understood that this covenant had been imported by the founders into the United States of America. Glenn Beck, Russell Ballard, and Tim Ballard share a belief in the covenant. In 2019, Russell Ballard toured covenant-related historical sites. He wrote, 
I visited Plymouth Plantation with my son Craig, son-in-law Brad, and family friend Tim Ballard. During this visit, Tim told the story of Henry Knox, a Boston bookseller who joined the American Revolution and played a key role in forcing the British military out of Boston. Tim Ballard described the miracle of God to aid Knox moving artillery cannon from New York to Boston. Ballard said God made it snow, so heavy cannon could be moved on sleds. One of the stops on the Ballard Covenant tour was the John Adams Library, where Tim Ballard says he saw an 1841 copy of the Book of Mormon, once owned by Emma Smith and signed by Joseph Smith. But, oddly, Ballard never bothers to show the book in his 12-minute YouTube video. During an October 2019 speech, Russell Ballard asked Boston LDS members to join a new movement and pray for the nation and its leaders. A news account says during a trip this past summer, President Ballard learned of the many miracles the Lord provided for them. He said, Diaries of the founding fathers and mothers reveal a belief that if they would stay close to God, they had a better chance at receiving needed miracles. This relationship with God can be seen as a covenant relationship. This was the covenant formula Nephi saw that brought independence and the restoration of the gospel, which came through prayer and righteous believers in God. Our nation was founded on prayer. It was preserved by prayer, and we need prayer again. Remember this country was established and preserved by our founding fathers and mothers, who repeatedly acknowledged the hand of God through prayer. This area was the seedbed of so very much that led to the founding of this nation. Tonight, I invite you to join in a new movement. I invite your neighbors, your colleagues, your friends on social media to pray for this country. The covenant theory propounded by Glenn Beck and Tim and Russell Ballard puts Mormonism at the focal point of miraculous events at the outset of American history. Just as 15th century Catholic orthodoxy placed the earth at the center of the solar system, Mormon orthodoxy, that is to say the covenant, places Mormonism at the center of American historical events. So that's the spiritual connection between Russell Ballard and OUR. Is there a financial connection? Which leads to this question. Did Russell Ballard invest in OUR? A former employee told me Russell Ballard invested money in OUR. That did not make sense. You don't invest in a nonprofit, you donate. A former OUR donor I interviewed believes there is a financial relationship, a silent financial partnership with Elder Ballard and some of the for profit companies that are benefiting from OUR. Well, I ask, what for profit companies? He said, like slave stealers and others. So I asked the question, why set up for-profit companies? He answered, for Tim Ballard to benefit financially from the nonprofit OUR and to take him off the nonprofit OUR payroll where he earned $343,000 in 2018. And he said, Tim Ballard told him, this is what God wants, so we don't need to be on the payroll of the foundation. Did anyone else participate in the suspected investments? If you recall, Russell Ballard said his son Craig and son-in-law Brad Brower were on the 2019 Covenant Tour. They might also figure into Russell Ballard's financial tie to OUR. If Russell Ballard invested with OUR or a nonprofit spinoff, he could find himself in the crosshairs of a criminal investigation. I was the first to report that Davis County Attorney Troy Rawlings had begun a criminal probe into Operation Underground Railroad. The investigation could be looking into how OUR raised money, or even what it did with the money. Who could be charged? How wide a net could Rawlings and his investigators be casting? It's up to him. Rawlings could be casting a short net and looking just at Tim Ballard and OUR employees, 
Or he could toss his net further and investigate Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. Or, further yet, and possibly ensnare Russell Ballard. That Utah's top law enforcement officer and a top Mormon leader could be caught up in a criminal enterprise seems preposterous. Investigators will likely follow the money. It's a catchphrase popularized by the 1976 film, All the President's Men. Here's the scene where Woodward, played by Robert Redford, meets Deep Throat in a parking lot to get guidance. Supposedly he's got a lawyer with $25,000 in a brown paper bag. They follow the money. What do you mean? Just follow the money. The movie touched off a wave of investigative reporting across the United States. Robert Redford predicted that surge, but made a rather bleak prophecy about it. I interviewed him the very evening he completed shooting the film. He said a lot of reporters were ill-prepared to get into investigative reporting, which could lead to its demise. In fact, investigative reporting did skyrocket, then plummeted, which may explain why no major Utah news outlet has investigated OUR. None is following the money. Millions of donor dollars flow in and out of OUR, perhaps all legally. But is any siphoned off illegally to Tim Ballard or his for-profit entities or to Sean Reyes or Russell Ballard entities? In 2018, Ballard formed the Utah for-profit entity Slave Stealers LLC. Then in 2020, the Florida company Stowaway Productions was organized to produce a multi-season film series based on Tim Ballard's book, Slave Stealers. It's about untold stories of America's centuries-long war with slavery. There's something curious about Slave Stealers' formation. The Articles of Incorporation show the company's principal office to be at 228 South, 200 West in Farmington. That's the office location of Russell Ballard's son-in-law, Brad Brower. He declined comment. Here are some more OUR-related for-profits. Liberty 89. Sean Reyes was a featured speaker. It says our short videos and articles articulate the virtues and values that America was founded upon and needs to continue to build upon. Salvo LLC. It offers active shooter and child trafficking liberation training to law enforcement and schools. Back to the question, did Russell Ballard or any family members invest in OUR? I asked the Mormon Church's Public Affairs Office and directly President Ballard's office for an interview and comment. They declined. Next, I'm going to look at Russell Ballard's past financial conduct as a possible indicator of any OUR financial involvement. It's a history of business failures and alleged fraud. In 1953, Russell Ballard, at age 23, after returning from an LDS mission, began selling cars at his father's Nash dealership on South Main in Salt Lake. Here's what a 53 Nash looked like. In the mid-50s, Russell Ballard was involved in unspecified business activity. His biographies only disclose an involvement with investment businesses between selling cars at his father's dealership and then returning to take it over. One of them says he was the top-selling salesman for his father's car dealership when he left in the early 1950s to pursue other business interests. Another says in 1956, he returned and took over the Ballard Motor Company from his father. Here's what Ballard was actually doing during the mid-50s. In 1954, at 26, he engaged in Utah's ultra-volatile, fraud-ridden, penny stock market. He continued even after taking over his father's dealership. In 1954, he formed Tatro Uranium Incorporated as president. Tatro had merged with Bojo Uranium Company. It traded for around 10 cents a share. Before continuing with Ballard's investment history, this background. 
Since the 80s, I have reported extensively about Utah's connection to penny stock fraud. Utah's penny stock market is the main factor behind Utah's reputation as fraud capital of the United States. That reputation continues to this day, augmented by other types of fraud related to door-to-door -door sales, multi-level marketing, and nutritional supplement sales. An example of the ongoing problem, Neldon Johnson. Here I am in 2012 with Johnson standing in front of one of the giant solar lenses that was part of his scheme. He's a Mormon inventor who claims an angel appeared to him. His penny stock scheme went on for more than 30 years. Positive news reports by Utah media drove up stock prices. It was also a multi-level marketing tax avoidance scheme that went on more than 10 years. In 2020, a federal judge fined Johnson $50 million and ordered him to quit promoting his ventures. But neither Utah's Attorney General nor U.S. Attorney for Utah ever charged Johnson with stock fraud or multi-level marketing fraud. Speaking of the Attorney General, check out his website. He asks, Is Utah the fraud capital of the U.S.? He answers, Yes. Yes, we are. Reyes is part of the fraud problem he talks about on his website. He not only fails to prosecute penny stock fraud, but he also promotes penny stock ventures. Examples, Twin Lab, Vertra, Liberty Defense, and NARC X. Going back more than a century, Utah Stock Exchange, in essence, legalized gambling. One observer wrote, Salt Lake City, that citadel of conservative Mormonism, became the gambling capital of the world. In 1985, John Baldwin, director of Utah's Security Division, testified before Congress. He said penny stock fraud has flourished in Salt Lake City since Utah's earliest mining days. He said penny stock swindles are the number one threat of fraud and abuse facing small investors in the United States. Back to the Russell Ballard story. He returned to his father's dealership and took over at age 28 while still engaged in the penny stock business. In the meantime, he began his ascent to power in the LDS Church, serving as a counselor to bishops, then bishop. In 1957, Ballard dropped the Nash American Motors car line and picked up the Edsel franchise. Russell said he prayed about the decision. When Ford showed him the car for the first time, Russell received the impression, do not sign the franchise. In just a year, Ford Motor and its dealers lost hundreds of millions of dollars. He said the result of not following the prompting of the Spirit, I took our company very close to the brink of bankruptcy. Ballard's Edsel failure is a story he has told and retold over the years. Years ago, when I was in business, I learned a very expensive lesson because I did not listen carefully to the counsel of my father, nor did I heed the promptings of the Spirit giving me guidance from my Heavenly Father. Ford executives invited my father and me to a preview showing of what they thought to be a spectacularly successful product. When we saw the cars, my father, who had over 35 years' experience in the business, cautioned me about becoming a dealer. However, the Ford sales personnel were very persuasive, and I chose to become Salt Lake City's first and actually last Edsel dealer. <laughs> and if you don't know what an Edsel is, ask your grandpa and he'll tell you that the Edsel was a spectacular failure. While his Edsel dealership floundered, Ballard opened his own penny stock brokerage, Keystone Securities Corporation. A Wall Street Journal article reported that Ballard was accused of stock price manipulation. The Securities and Exchange Commission determined Ballard committed fraud and revoked his broker-dealer license. 
Here's the SEC newsletter account. The SEC charged the Keystone Securities and its president, M. R. Ballard, engaged in stock price manipulation and fraud in connection with Shasta Minerals and Chemical Stock. News about the SEC's fraud finding lingered. But even before the dust settled on penny stock fraud accusations against Ballard, he launched a new public offering. In 1964, he began raising investor money to build the Valley Music Hall in North Salt Lake. Here's how Ballard's biography portrays his Valley Music Hall stock offering. One highlight of his business career was his presidency of the Valley Music Hall in Bountiful, Utah, which offered high-quality family entertainment. There, Ballard worked with Art Linkletter, Danny Thomas, Bob Cummings, and other Hollywood celebrities who were advisors to the enterprise. Although the music hall failed financially, he ensured that investors recovered the money invested. Was it a highlight or a low light? How were investments recovered? Valley Music Hall shares might have been penny stocks traded over the counter. It's not clear whether it was a private or a public offering. There was a public offering registered with the SEC. Groundbreaking for Ballard's enterprise was a star-studded affair. The Mormon Church lent credibility to the venture with N. Eldon Tanner of the First Presidency wielding one of the ceremonial shovels. Tanner disregarding Ballard's earlier penny stock-related fraud is not surprising. Tanner himself invested in the early 70s NAVSAT fraud, along with other general authorities who put money in that and the related American Ranch and Recreation fraud. The LDS Church bought some of the scam's recreation property, apparently to bail out Sterling's cell. One investor donated fraudulent penny stock as in-kind tithing. Anyway, the Valley Music Hall turned out to be a financial disaster. It constantly bled red ink. Ballard attempted various schemes to rescue Valley Music Hall investors. He formed the door-to-door -door sales company Family Achievement Institute, to acquire Valley Music Hall. It marketed vinyl recordings of Mormon-themed self-help messages by Art Linkletter, Pat Boone, and others. It also sold illustrated Bibles and Books of Mormon. Ballard advertised his door-to-door -door sales program in LDS Church publications. One of the ads said a return of $16,320 per month is possible on an investment of from $3,000. Therein was one of the catches. If you wanted to sell the product, you had to buy some of it. It was a division of International Marketing Corporation out of Oklahoma. The FTC sanctioned that company. It claimed IMC made false, misleading, and deceptive statements and misled members, that is, the salespeople, with regard to purchasing substantial quantities of products. After five years and more than a million dollars in losses, the LDS Church bought Ballard's White Elephant, and Eldon Tanner made the announcement. Even before selling the Valley Music Hall, Ballard began acquiring stock in a variety of companies, including at least two being traded on the notoriously corrupt Vancouver, Canada Stock Exchange. The Vancouver Exchange was known to mostly trade shares of companies that were ultra-high risk or outright frauds. Valley Music Hall Incorporated, in the meantime, had been renamed Family Achievement Institute, then renamed Intermountain Industries, and then underwent a complex reverse merger and renamed Dynapack Inc. Summarizing Russell Ballard to this point, he engaged in what the SEC determined was penny stock fraud, had his broker's license revoked, his auto dealership failed, the Valley Music Hall venture was a massive failure, despite being endorsed and supported by church leaders and being bailed out by the church, averting any criminal investigation. Going forward, this spoiler alert, Ballard continued investing in Get Rich Quick, highly speculative penny stock schemes after going to work for the church full-time. For sure, Ballard did not practice what he preached. For example, he said there are no shortcuts to financial security. 
There are no get-rich-quick schemes that work. He said, do not trust your money to others without a thorough evaluation of any proposed investment. Our people, referring to Mormons, have lost far too much money by trusting their assets to others. We as leaders need to teach our people that they must become efficient managers of their time and resources. Invest wisely, avoid speculations, and get rich quick schemes. In 1976, while serving as a mission president in Canada, Russell Ballard was called to be an LDS general authority. In 1985, he was elevated to apostle. But he was still not finished with risky investments in penny stocks. For example, his involvement with former White House advisor, Mormon leader, penny stock promoter, Stephen Stuttert. Stuttert appeared on the cover of This People magazine. In the article, said Elder Russell Ballard, a personal friend of Stuttert's, said wealth can be a terrible snare in life or a way to bless others. He said Steve is not a rich man, but I think his great wealth is his time given to his community. Stuttert starred on the national political stage as an advisor to presidents, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, George Bush. Stuttert managed Carl Snow's 1990 congressional campaign, and it did not go well. Snow's opponent kept asking, is Carl Snow telling you the truth about his penny stock investments? Carl Snow's campaign-killing penny stock misadventures did not keep his campaign chairman, Stuttert, from diving into his own penny stock ventures. Phonics was a biggie. It was formed by a reverse merger with a penny stock shell company and lost more than $100 million while its founders got rich. It also involves KLS and Viral Resources. More about that in a minute. Since Phonics, another string of stuttered penny stock ventures. Canyon Gold, Clifton Mining, Defense Technologies, and Global Cash Spot. Ballard supported Stuttert's failed Haiti venture. In 2010, he proposed a 10 to $20 million endowment for a Haiti hospital. Stuttert kicked off fundraising at a dinner banquet headlined by Mormon Apostle Elder M. Russell Ballard and attended by Utah Governor Gary Herbert. Since then, hounded by creditors, sued by several groups for misrepresentation and fraud. Now I'll talk about KLS and Viro Resources that I mentioned a second ago. KLS and Viro Resources was formerly KLS Gold Mining Company. It was a Nevada corporation based in Texas. At one time, Stutter was CEO. Russell Ballard's Ballard Investment Company Limited was involved financially acquiring as many as 1.6 million shares via what appears to be a $710,000 loan from a line of credit at Zions Bank. Craig Ballard, his son, and Brad Brower, son-in-law, were invested in the enterprise as well. Ballard's dubious loan was part of a 1998 lawsuit. According to the Associated Press, in 1986, Phonics, working on computer voice recognition technology, loaned $1.9 million to KLS and Viral Resources, then an insolvent Texas gold mining company. The lawsuit contended that after KLS was propped up to the point it had earnings potential, Phonics executives, including Stutter, began making personal investments in the Texas company. On December 31, 1996, the company sold for cash, then assigned part of the balance due under the $710,000 promissory note to Ballard Investment Company. Next up, the Ballard's investments in BioMeridian, a penny stock company that marketed a quack medical appliance. Here's what the appliance looks like. Practitioners used it to determine if a person's organs were out of balance and needed nutritional supplements. It was on quack watches electrodiagnostic scam list. I've reported before on alternative medicine and electrodermal diagnostic devices. 
In 1994, I reported about Mormon Church President Ezra Tab Benson undergoing electrodermal diagnoses. He was treated by Dr. F. Fuller Royal using the Acupath 1000. Ezra Taft and his son Reed underwent treatments in Las Vegas and both believed in homeopathic alternative medicine. Same year, I reported on Orrin Hatch's alternative medicine treatments. It was about his tie to homeopathic and vitamin supplement cures, as well as his tie to Utah's fraud riddled penny stock industry. Hatch's cure involved an electrolyzer marketed by the penny stock company Viral Control Inc. Senator Hatch is still boosting suspect penny stock ventures. He sits on the Predictive Technology Group's board of directors. In April, the Securities and Exchange Commission halted Predictive's trading. Trading was suspended after Predictive touted a rapid test for COVID-19. The SEC continues to crack down on companies promoting unproven products relating to the coronavirus outbreak. With that background, back to BioMeridian. Ballard-related entities made loans and acquired 200,000 shares in 1997 at 38 cents a share. By 2000, Ballard Investments owned 1.9 million shares. That was about 6.4% of the company. In 2001, ownership dropped slightly. Were they selling? To 1.8 million shares. BioMeridian was permanently revoked in 2003. The share price is now at a fraction of a penny. The BioMeridian appliance was usually used by chiropractors, multi-level marketers, hawking nutritional supplements, and by alternative medicine practitioners. Here's how it worked. BioMeridian assessment works with the meridian system. Uh, meridians are rivers of energy that flow through every organ, every system in the body. Mm -hmm. If there's an imbalance in that organ, that system, we could find it through the meridians. So what we're doing is measuring that energy. And we're looking for it to show up here. And we're looking for everything to go into that green line there. Anything above is telling me that organ is, system is stressed. Anything below is telling me it's in a weakened state. And when these things are out of balance, what we do is we look for natural remedies to pull you back into balance again. Right. Every, every supplement has its own vibrational field as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look for something to pull you into balance again. This is a lot more sensitive than blood work. We're going to measure the energy on the adrenal point. And that's perfect, so I know... In 2006, a company called Fresh Medical Laboratories licensed BioMeridian technology. The company developed a device to detect lung cancer. It changed its name to ProLung Inc. Nate Wade, a former Russ Ballard partner, was a director. According to its 2017 SEC report, shares of our common stock are low-priced or penny stock resulting in increased risks to our investors. In 2017, Prolung tried to go public but failed to meet requirements. The next year, Prolung directors engaged in a bitter fight. The CEO was accused of theft and misleading shareholders. Directors accused him of botching the attempt to take the company public and fired him. Utah securities regulators ordered Prolung to cease and desist from violating Utah securities law and the company was fined $55,000. In 2020, the company was renamed Ionic, rebranded, now says it focuses on science and attaining FDA approval. The Russell Ballard family may still own a few million shares. If Ionic gets FDA approval, the family could make millions. Summing up, Davis County investigators will likely follow most of the money going in and out of OUR. For Russell Ballard to find himself in a criminal probe's crosshairs, he would needed to have invested in an OUR-connected entity and participated in a related financial crime. At the moment, he's not answering questions. It could be months before the prosecutor decides to bring charges against anyone or no one. Finally, this postscript. Utah's mainstream media has done no investigative reporting on OUR. Even worse... 
Too often there's fake investigative reporting. An example, KSL Television's purported investigative report in November. An hour before the newscast, a teaser said, a KSL investigation revealed a sharp increase in online child sex crimes in Utah during 2020. Look what it says behind the anchors. A surge in child predators. On analysis, this report gets an F. Actually, an F-. minus. KSL offered no proof, no studies that showed there's been a surge in child predators, a sharp increase in child sex crimes in Utah, or that crimes against kids are on the rise. Law enforcement officers KSL interviewed only added to the confusion, as reflected in this excerpt from the report. The KSL investigators have uncovered a disturbing trend, a sharp increase in online child sex crimes in Utah during 2020. The number of cases that were referred to us from the 1st of March through the end of June are 50% more than what we saw last year at the same time. Unfortunately, crimes against kids are on the rise. I, I can't say I've ever seen an increase this substantial. An actual fact buried in KSL's story undercuts its sensational headlines. It said child predator tips jumped 50% in Utah during COVID-19. That's tips, not crimes. But even that fact is wildly misleading. Most, if not all, of the surge in phone tips were not actual crimes, but false alarms resulting from last summer's Wayfair and QAnon conspiracy theories. All KSL's reporter Brittany Glass needed to have done was go online. There are dozens of reports about the surge in hotline calls. For example, the New York Times. Fans of the pro-Trump conspiracy theory QAnon are clogging anti-trafficking hotlines, raising false fears about child exploitation. The Washington Post. A national human trafficking hotline suddenly began taking a number of calls about the imagined Wayfair scheme, stretching its resources. KSL's reporter and the officers she interviewed were echoing OUR's fear-mongering. Tim Ballard said, 2020 has been a horrific year for our children. Reports of child abuse cases are millions higher this year than they were last year. This is not a conspiracy theory, Ballard said. This is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. Even OUR's own website contradicts Ballard, the AG's office, and KSL News. It said conspiracy-related reports from people with no direct knowledge of trafficking situations can overwhelm services meant for victims. My next report, Washington State Law Enforcement Cuts Its Ties with OUR. Thanks for watching.